invest in that and uh, spends time and uh, effort to practice and and get ready and the worship is just absolutely uh, spot on and I appreciate it greatly. This morning I want you to take your Bibles if you would uh, to Genesis chapter number 39. Uh, Genesis chapter number 39 and uh, I was just incredibly encouraged uh, this month at uh, our missions emphasis month and being able to take a look at uh, missions, missionaries and things like that. Uh, it's neat to have an outside perspective sometimes. And so Trent, as he was here last week, uh, he was just so excited about uh, what God has done here. Sometimes we forget that God's done a lot here just in three and a half years. And uh, we were just really excited about that. And we were talking about just the people that have gotten saved and the people that have gotten baptized. And we're introducing them to people and uh, telling stories of when you found Christ and things like that. And uh, he, he remarked to me on Sunday afternoon, he said, God's doing some incredibly, uh, incredibly awesome stuff. And he said, it's really neat because in a lot of ways you have a, a, not just a young church as far as age, but you have a ton of new Christians and new believers. And even some of you that maybe you've been a Christian for a little while, uh, maybe in the years since you've been here, you're beginning to grow and develop and really uh, flourish. And God is doing something great in your life. And with that, you ready? With that uh, comes difficulty. And with that comes trials. And with that comes adversity. We all remember, if we've been saved for a little time, uh, we all remember when we first got saved, the zealousness that was there, the fervor, the excitement, the fire, and then it felt like everything just kind of started coming at us, right? And you thought, man, when I become a Christian, it's all supposed to get better, and then it got really difficult, and you experienced trials uh, as you did before you were saved, and you experienced uh, heartache as you did before you were saved, and you experienced uh, difficulties and things like that. And for some new Christians, as they get saved, uh, when those things happen, they think to themselves, I thought when I got Jesus, life was going to get better. And can I tell you this morning that when uh, you begin a relationship with Jesus, life does get better, Amen. but it doesn't mean that it necessarily gets, you ready, easier. <laughs> uh, because difficulties are still there and heartache is still there and the bills they still come, and it's like, you just want to write back to your mortgage company, uh, dear mortgage company, uh, since you've last sent me the bill, I have accepted Christ as my Savior. He is now my Father, and uh, He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. If you could do me a favor and forward this to Him next month, that would be great, right? But the bills still come, and the heartache's still there, and difficulties, and those diagnoses are, are still there, and, and sometimes you get disheartened. And those relationships that were strained sometimes prior to Christ now fracture after Christ. And those, those things that we were just on pins and needles about, they fall apart. And to be very, very honest, in our church, in churches around the world, in the lives of Christians, it's very easy when things start going rough to get disillusioned. And it's really easy when things get difficult to kind of step back and uh, kind of check out. And I'm not just talking about church services. I'm talking about maybe where you wanted to read your Bible a few weeks ago. Now it's kind of like eh. where you were quick to pray when you first got saved. Now it's kind of like I'm too tired to pray. Right? Where you were so excited to be a part of God's plan now you're kind of weary and well-doing, right? And whether you've been saved a week or a month or a year or 10 years or 25 years, we all go through those moments in life. Moments where we're presented with things that cause us to be, can I say, fearful? Fearful? Or even moments when that fear takes hold of our life and we make decisions that we know we shouldn't and we fail. Moments of fear, moments of failure. This morning, I want to talk to you about something that's been burning in my heart for over a month. Uh, the whole time we're preaching through this mission series, uh, specifically the last couple of weeks, God is just burning in me the desire uh, to talk about this subject, uh, the idea of faithfulness. Faithfulness. And uh, as, as I get into this, we're going to take a look at this text and 
presents uh, this, this idea of faithfulness very clearly to us. I'm very excited about it. But as we get into it, I want to kind of give you where I'm coming from here. As the, as the pastor of this church, I'm to, be, I'm to be a shepherd. I'm to be an under-shepherd. Christ, the head of this church, it's his church, not my church. If I die, he, this church goes on. This is his church. Uh, he allows me to serve here. I'm thankful for that. But as the shepherd here, my responsibility is to look after each of you. Uh, the Bible tells me that one day I'll give an account for your souls. And so my, my pastoring is intimately uh, connected to your life. And, and, and to be very honest, whenever you struggle, uh, it, it's on my heart. And whenever you're getting that bad diagnosis, I, I bear that as well. And, and the things that keep you up at night, they, they trouble me. And, and I kind of get a, a, a compilation of all of your pain. And I'm as your shepherd to help you bear that and to to encourage you and to support you and to, to provoke you into good works. And so as your shepherd, something that I'm seeing in our church and something that I want to address now and something that I want to kind of put out here now is this. It is, it is increasingly tempted, uh, tempting rather, that when life gets difficult to just check out of what we know to do, right? And the truth is we, we know, we know uh, what God's called us to do. We know the way he'd have us live. But man, when the heat turns up, it's easy to pull back. Are you following me? For every person that's here this morning, I'm so thankful you're here. Uh, when I stand up to preach, I'm excited because I see new faces, but I also see empty seats. And I know the people that aren't in those seats. And I know the struggles they're facing because Facebook tells me, or, the, or they tell me, right? Uh, <laughs> I have Facebook too, guys. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's funny, but it's, it's true, man. I, I see the struggles of your life. And, and to be honest, I relate because I have struggles. And you're broken, and I'm broken. And, and we all have that. But I see not just a room full of people that I'm excited are here, but I see people that aren't here that should be. I see people that, man, they need encouragement, they need, they need support, and they need that provocation, if you will, to good works. And can I tell you that you've made the right decision to be here today, and I'm proud of you. But if I can just kind of encourage you this morning about this thought, I would hope that this message is something that you can hold on to when life gets difficult. And I pray, my prayer, my hope for our church, to be really honest, my, my prayer and my hope for our church is not that we'd be a mega church, not that we would be the greatest giving church, not that we'd have the most missionaries or we build the nicest building. My prayer, you ready for this? My prayer is that we'd be faithful. Why? Because my job as a pastor is to find faithful men and women and invest my life in them so that they can then invest their lives in others. That is 2 Timothy 2.2. 2, the things that thou hast learned. You've, you've been assured of. You, you know the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And I'll tell you this. I'm sick of caring about talent. I'm sick about caring about prestige or who somebody... My, my, my heart for our church is that we just be faithful. We just be faithful. So we're going to take a look at a, a man in the Bible. Probably the most similarities between an individual and Christ of anyone in the Bible. And that is the man Joseph. Would you take your Bibles there to Genesis 39? And uh, when we think about that word faithful... We think about, if we were to define it, someone that's true to their word, someone that's true to their promises, their, their steady and allegiance or affection, they're loyal, and they're constant. And just to be very honest with you, my favorite characteristic of God is that He is faithful. My very favorite characteristic of God is that He's faithful. I'm thankful that he's good and that he's loving and that he's merciful. But I'm very thankful he's constant. I'm thankful that he's faithful to me. And that inspires me, inspires me to be faithful to him. A young man uh, applied for a job as a farmhand. And uh, when the farmer asked for his qualifications, he said this. He said, well, I can sleep when the wind blows. 
I can sleep when the wind blows. Well, this kind of puzzled the farmer because he, he liked the young man. He's so like, went ahead and hired him. Or a few days later, the farmer, his wife, they were awakened in the middle of the night by, by a violent storm. And they began to check everything out, make sure it was all secure. And they found that the shutters to the farmhouse had been securely fastened. There's a good supply of logs that had been set next to the fireplace. And then they found the young man sleeping soundly. The farmer and his wife continued to check out their property. They found that the farm tools had been placed in the shed away from the elements. They found uh, that the tractor had been moved into the garage and that the barn uh, was properly locked. Even the animals were calm. All was well. And then he understood what the young man was saying. I can sleep when the wind blows. And here's the deal. He did his work loyally and he did it faithfully when the skies were clear. And because of that, he was prepared for the storm when it broke. So, so when the wind blew, he wasn't afraid. He could sleep in peace. And this story gives us a principle that we would do really well to learn. There wasn't anything dramatic or sensational about his preparations. He just faithfully did what was needed each day. And consequently, peace was him, his, even in the midst of a storm. I heard this said, and I thought it was a great quote. It isn't the things you do, it's the things you leave undone, which gives you a bit of heartache at the setting of the sun. And can I, can I tell you this? If you're faithful uh, during the times when things are good, and you continue to practice that faithfulness when things are difficult, you would do well in life. If you are, the reason we're going to do a series on emotion is because if we're constantly swayed by and moved by our emotions, if we're constantly blowing about everywhere that the wind blows, man, we are going to have a hard time in life. Joseph is someone who could rest easy at night because he had been faithful. When he was at home with Jacob prior to the pit, he had been a faithful son. When he had minded his father's flocks, he was a faithful worker. When he was sold to Potiphar, he was a faithful servant. And because he was faithful, God blessed everything that he did. So this morning, as we look at this passage, we're going to see the faithfulness of Joseph very quickly. I want you to look in verse number 7 of Genesis chapter number 39. And we'll read down to begin with to verse number 12. If you're there, say amen. amen. And it came to pass after these things. Let's pause a moment. The things that had transpired before this. Uh, David, or Joseph rather, was sold into slavery. He was dumped into a pit. Uh, his brothers hated him. They wanted to kill him. They ended up selling him. He is now living in the ruler here of Egypt, Potiphar's house. And the Bible says, it came to pass after these things. That his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. She said, lie with me. But he refused, and he said unto his master's wife, behold... My master wotteth not what is uh, with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There's none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her, to lie by her or to be with her. You notice that in verse 10, day by day, this wasn't a one-time temptation. Potiphar's wife knew what she wanted, and Joseph was it, right? So day by day, and yet he hearkened not unto her. Verse number 11, it came to pass about this time that Joseph went in the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she, Potiphar's wife, caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and I love the next uh, three words there, and got him out. <laughs> he left. He gone, right? Uh, why? He was faithful in spite of temptations. Let's pray for a moment here, and we're going to jump into our text. Father, we thank you for who you are. Thank you for the chance to open your word. Father, I pray that you bless it. I pray that you'd speak to us. I pray that, pray that you'd work in us. And uh, Father, I pray that you'd accomplish in us exactly what you'd want to. I pray that you would... Uh, guard what I say, that I'd say nothing that would hinder or harm what you want to do here, uh, that everything I say would be what you'd have me say. 
And God, mostly that your spirit would work in our midst, that your word would not return void, and that you'd accomplish in us everything you'd want to. We love you. We praise you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's get the context of what's going on here. Joseph here is ministering in Potiphar's house. And he caught the eye of Potiphar's wife. She begins to flirt with him. After a short time, she becomes downright brazen in her approach toward him, asking Joseph to lie with her. And he, had, he resists her advances, but she's persistent. And on a day when she was in the house alone with Joseph, she came in and she grabbed him. And she said, come on now, I'm serious. And he got him out. <laughs> he ran out. He left his garment there with her. And uh, he ran out. And I want you to think about this situation because I think a lot of times we think that men, women in the Bible are uh, superheroes and that they are not relatable and there is nothing about their story that coincides with our story and thus they can be spiritual giants but we can't because that's not real. I want you to think about uh, Joseph here. Joseph is a man. He has naturally certain desires and uh, certain things that I'm sure uh, that he would uh, 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 feel, and he's tempted here uh, with this desire. But, but, he says, my desire here is not uh, sufficient for me to compromise in a way that I know uh, not to. He understands that this is another man's wife. He understands that this is not his wife. Think about the fact Joseph is a long way from home. He is in a strange land. Some people would say, well, when in Rome, do as the Romans, right? And a lot of people live like that. A lot of people will do things when they travel on the road, perhaps, that they'd never do at home. There are things that young people might do at a party that they would never do at home. But Joseph here doesn't care where he's at. What he cares about is doing the right thing. And can I say the right thing is the right thing regardless of where you are? Think about that. The right thing is always the right thing regardless of where you are. And so Joseph here tempted. Miss Potiphar is probably a, a beautiful woman. You say, well, it doesn't say that. Uh, Egyptian women were renowned in that day uh, for their physical beauty. And I just happened to think, that Potiphar, as the leader of the people, probably didn't marry someone he wasn't attracted to. Does that make logical sense to you? So I dare say she's probably pretty attractive. Yes? Here's Joseph. Joseph's in bondage. Jo Joseph's a long way from home. Joseph, uh, by the way, let me just say this. Joseph had just been promoted. And literally everything that Potiphar had in this moment is his other than, you ready? His wife. And here's his wife saying, you have everything else. Here you go. Are you following me? I'm just saying it would not be a stretch, regardless of the commitment and character that Joseph had. It would not be a stretch to think that after the initial temptation and then pursuant temptations and her coming at him every single day, it would not be a stretch to say Joseph had a weak moment and gave in to temptation. Are you following what I'm saying? After all, everything that was familiar in his life had broken down. At this point, and Joseph is a man, but yet in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of breakdown, in the midst of temptation, Joseph remains true to what he knows. The true measure of faithfulness is what we do when temptation is turned on. A true measure of faithfulness is what we do when temptation turns on. This comes really at the perfect time if Joseph is going to give in to do so. I mean, this is the time. And I'll, I'll just say this morning, if you're in a situation in your life where you're embracing temptation, where you're giving in to temptation, this is going to be an uncomfortable message for you. But can I just say that with that temptation, the Bible teaches us that there is a way of escape. And we're going to look at that in, in just a moment. I want you to think about temptation here. Our enemy is a master at setting things up. He is a master of deception. 
From the very beginning, when we're first introduced to the, the wicked one, Satan, the, the fallen one, the, the, the enemy of God, when we're first introduced to him, how do we see him presented? The very first introduction uh, uh, to Satan, what is the first character trait of Satan that we would notice? Anybody? Beautiful? He's deceptively beautiful. He, he's deceptively beautiful. What does he do? He begins to take the words of God... And he begins to do what? He twists them. He turns them, corrupts them, perverts them. And can I tell you that the same way that Satan operated in the garden, he operates today. And here's how that looks, just bringing it to our world, bringing it into reality. Here's how it looks. Man, you make a decision, I'm going to follow Christ. Man, I'm all in. I, I'm tired of living the way I'm living. I, I, I'm sitting here under preaching. I'm hearing the word of God. I'm reading my Bible. The Spirit's working in me. And God is doing something in me to say, everything that you're living for is not worth uh, living for. And it's leaving you empty. And it's leaving you broken. And it's leaving you undone. And you bear scars of all of that. But come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come unto me. Learn of me. Take my yoke upon you. Are you following what I'm saying? And you hear that message, and you hear the truth of the gospel, that God loves man, and that he demonstrated his love toward man, and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And you hear that truth, and you say, man, that sounds good. And really, you'd be foolish not to. <clears throat> and you say, sign me up. Man, that sounds great. And you place your faith in Christ. And you say, God, I'm going to follow you. And with pure intent, you commit yourself to him. And you say, God, teach me and show me, mold me and make me. And what happens? You lose your job. <laughs> yeah, you get in a car accident. Your insurance had just lapsed yesterday. I mean, you were calling today about it. You get an accident. You get pulled over. And it's like the, the police officer was sitting outside of your house waiting for you to drive away because he knew your registration expired yesterday, right? <laughs> Life begins to happen, and that friend that you've not heard from for a long time reaches out. That friend that you're no good with, that fire and gasoline friend, are you following me? They reach out, hey, man, it's been a minute. Let's get together. Hey, girl. Oh, wait for this. Here it goes. <laughs> hey, what are you doing? You want to just go? And you think to yourself, well, man, I'm, I'm a different creature now. I'm a, I'm a, they don't know the new me, right? Because if any man's in Christ, he's a what? New, new creature? Old things pass away. All things become new. They don't know the new me. But you, but you think, I want to be their friend. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Jonathan said that in church. I bless God, I'm going to be a good friend. And so you meet them where they say, and you sit down, and they say, oh, you don't drink anymore? Oh, you're trying to be so, oh, oh, good for you. Right? Oh, I'm so proud of you. Right? <laughs> And, and you sit there, and you're feeling that pressure, and you're, and you're thinking, well, surely one drink can't be that bad. Well, one time that I go do this can't be that bad. Are you following what I'm saying? And, and here's what happens. We make that decision, and, and we make that not-so-bad decision. But then two days later, pops up. And guess what it's easier to do? Easier to fail again. And then a week, two weeks, three weeks later, Sunday morning our alarm goes off, and we don't want to go to church. And we get up on Monday morning to go to work, and, and that Bible's sitting there, and... Ah, yeah. And, and, and that day at work... Your coworker mistreats you, and, and you think about praying, but you just put that to the side, and you look for, yeah, there she is, Betty. Let's talk, Betty. Betty, guess what Gertrude did, right? Hazel, you pick it. It's always an old lady name, so if you, oh, did I say that? Oh. If your name is Gertrude or Hazel, I have really enjoyed having you at our church. <laughs> And I am so sorry, Jonathan. 
And you go and you talk and you lay out all your s- stuff, right? And, and what happens? The God who saved you, the God who works in your heart, the God you know to be good, you pull away from him. And your life in that moment could be described in a lot of ways, but faithful is not one of them. Now, how is it that if two people were to stand up here and get married, and we were to find out as a family member, as a friend or whatever, spouse, whoever it is, we were to find out that a week into the marriage, they had began to look to other places for fulfillment. Are you following what I'm saying? How is it that if someone were to do that, we would say, oh, my goodness. And we would say, foul, no good, off limits, wrong. But yet we feel it okay to cheat on God. Why? You say, well, Jonathan, you're asking me to be something that I cannot be, and that's, that's perfect. You remember when I started this message, I said we're all broken people seeking to follow God? Listen, failure's not lost on me. And failure hurts really bad when it happens. And when I sin, it sinks in because not only am I a husband, and not only am I a father, but I'm a pastor. The other day, <laughs> Brad was over the house and I'm getting something from the back of the truck, and I don't even remember what happened. Something dropped on my toe or something, and I go, and I caught most of it. <laughs> but he caught enough of it. You know, you know what? I'm not sitting here thinking, well, at least Brad knows that I'm real now. I'm thinking, Now, we laughed about it and after I apologized profusely and said, I am horrible. I am so. And he saw a side to me that is very real and there. But can I say <clears throat> that it is inexcusable to be unfaithful to God and to be okay with that? And if you can sin and have nothing tearing you up inside, there's a problem there. Hey, I got, got to this passage, and I read it this morning, and started to pray, and guess what happened? That wicked one, he's a tempter. And he loves to remind you of how you failed. And I'm praying, and I'm asking for God's power. And Satan's saying, fool, hypocrite, failure, are you following what I'm saying? <clears throat> Temptation's never from God. James 1 tells us that let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Temptation's always, always from within. The Bible continues on there in verse number 14. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And the Bible tells us that that lust, that temptation, that lust, there's a progression there. In verse number 15, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Can I tell you that sin is going to hold you much longer than you plan? We, we've heard that. We've heard that little quote, sin uh, takes you much further than you want to go. It keeps you much longer than you want to stay. It makes you pay much lo- more than you want to pay, right? So true. And sometimes we think we can just dabble in it. We can just play with it a little bit. We can just have a little pet sin. It, it's, it's like we, we treat our diet sometimes. We say we're not supposed to eat anything unhealthy, but we still pack a candy bar, right? Sin. The Bible says the progression of that sin is sin when it is finished bringeth forth, listen, death. Death. Say, Jonathan, what are you talking about? That temptation that you're feeling, that temptation that you're giving into. Hey, new Christian, that temptation that you're confronted with, that temptation, when you give into it, it has a price tag. It has a price tag. And God loves you. You're his child and you will pay that price If you do not, listen to me, if you do not seek a way out of temptation, you say, well, what are you talking about? There's always a way out of temptation. 
1 Corinthians 10.13 says, There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. What does that mean? No one has been tempted in a way that no other man has been tempted. Are you following me? We are all tempted. We are all tempted. But God is faithful. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. What do you mean? Regardless of how strong your temptation is, it is escapable. For Joseph, it was he got him out. <laughs> are you following me? He got him out. Can I give you some good advice, Christian? Sometimes the best decision you can possibly make is to leave the place that you're at. I have never heard of anyone getting drunk in McDonald's. Are you following what I'm saying? If you are in a place where you cannot handle the temptation, you need to leave that place. It, it, <laughs> this seems super basic, but it, here's the common theme with every person who gives into temptation. They think this. You ready? Right before they do it. It's like the redneck tagline, hey, y'all watch this, right? Here's the tagline for every person when they fail. I can handle this. I, I, can, I can handle this. You know, what, you know what every person who starts to do drugs and becomes an addict, you know what they first say? I, I can beat this. I'm not going to get addicted. Are you? Listen to me. Those of you who have struggled with substance abuse, none of you, none of you, none of you have ever started dealing with substances and thought to yourself, oh, man, let's try this. I'll become an addict. It'll be great. Yeah? Every one of you thought, this can't control me. I have a strong volition. I have a strong willpower. I have a strong... Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Every person, when they fail, they think, well, I can do this and it'll be okay. You know, affairs don't start at moving in, moving out of your house and moving in with somebody and just starting up life. Affairs start with that subtle glance, with that little touch. Affairs start with that little conversation that shouldn't be had on the side. Affairs start with that casual message or the deleting or hiding of stuff. That's how affairs start. They don't start with, oh, zero to a hundred. They start with little moments. The full-fledged addicts, listen, the before and after methamphetamine users, they don't go from here to here by, by, by instantly. They take decision, and they make a decision, and they make a decision, and what they thought they could control, you ready? It controls them. And here's what Joseph said, and here's what I admire. Joseph doesn't say, I'm a man of character. I'm a man of integrity. I can do this once, and I can say no more, Right? Joseph says, I'm not even going to be in the same room. And he, you ready? He got him out. And by the way, you know what he wasn't concerned about? He wasn't concerned about with what she was going to say. He wasn't concerned about where did his coat go? He, you know what he was concerned about? I can't deal with this temptation. I got to get out. And some of you, well, my friends are going to think less of me. I don't care what my friends think. I don't want to end up where they are. Right. But they, they're going to think I'm fuddy-duddy. Nobody even knows what fuddy-duddy means. <laughs> well, they're just not going to be my friends anymore. If a friend leaves you because you have brought God into your life, you want to sober up, you want to start living for something that will outlast you, and you lose that friend, that friend wasn't much of a friend to begin with. Say, Jonathan, why are you so passionate? I'm passionate about it because I'm watching sheep get picked off by wolves. And I can't grab every one of you before you go off the ravine. And I can't snag every one of you. But are you following what I'm saying? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Look here at uh, <clears throat> our text. I want you to... I want you to, by the, by the way, by the way, let me, sometimes we think we can never be like that guy because they're just, they're, they're superheroes, right? Can I tell you that every Christian in the world 
is not, or every super uh, Christian, every Christian that we would look at and say, wow, they accomplished great things for God. It is not because they themselves are supermen. Superman. I wore Superman socks. <clears throat> Squirrel. <clears throat> it is because they submitted to something inside of them that strengthened them and empowered them for the work at hand. You, you ready for this? The strongest man in the world is still a weak man because of sin. James Hudson Taylor said, Many Christians estimate difficulty in the light of their own resources, and thus they attempt very little, and they always fail. All giants of the faith have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on His power and presence to be with them. You know who the strongest man or woman in this room is? The one that realizes they're the weakest and God is their strength. It's not the most talented. By the way, what does the Bible say? Let him that standeth take heed lest he fall. Let, by the way, <laughs> I, I misquoted it. Let me fix it. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Some of us are so full of ourselves. And, and listen, we've grown up in church. We've heard all the lessons. Our kids are to the point they could teach the teachers in the back. We know all the songs. We can quote the, the invitation uh, verbatim. Uh, you can finish my sentences. You've been in church your whole life. You know these truths. You can teach them yourselves. And we think, <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm so-and-so. Here's my lineage, and here's my character, and here's my qualifications. And here, Let me just tell you this. Judas had a really good lineage. Now, on the other hand, Peter seemingly was a failure. And I ask you, who was the man God used? The failure that understood he was one. Who does the Bible say that was a man after God's own heart? David. Can I break something to you? David couldn't teach in our junior church. And David couldn't preach in our church. Murderer, adulterer. Are, are you listening to what I'm saying? But yet God says, man, after my heart, Here, here's the difference. The people that are used greatly in Scripture, here's what they all had in common. They realized your limita their limitations. And so I have a question. I have a question. And by the way, this isn't for the new Christian. This is for the seasoned one. Are you ready? What are your limitations? Because if I were to come up and I were to say, hey, what are your spiritual strengths? You could give me a list a mile long. <laughs> what are your limitations? Well, that's a great question. I care too much about people. <laughs> you ever talk to somebody and you ask them something and it comes out as a positive, like, I just give too much of myself. I don't recognize the end to myself and I just I care too much for everybody, right? And, and by saying their weakness, they're actually telling you what they perceive as their strength. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? <laughs> Here's the deal. If you never can admit that you're wrong, admit that you have limitations, admit that... Faithfulness, in spite of temptations. You ready for this? And this is, I'm glad this passage has this because this is so important. Because it's important for us to see faithfulness and temptation because we deal with temptations. But there are sometimes that temptations give way to trials. Temptations are things that we deal with because of our own lust, right? Every man's tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. And we have things that we deal with. But there are sometimes we just go through stuff. Trials. And we didn't ask for it. We didn't bring it on. That, that cancer diagnosis, we didn't see it coming. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? That, that financial decision, it wasn't, listen, it wasn't because we mishandled our finances. It was because we invested our money, what we thought wisely, and the market crashed, right? And our life savings gone, right? Trial, trial, trial. What's Joseph's trial? Look down in verse number, I believe it's 13. Verse 13 came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand was fled forth that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew again to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. Is that what happened? Because it doesn't seem like what we just saw, right? Verse 15, It came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. 
That's called dramatic effect. She lays down and she sticks the garment beside her. Oh, Potiphar, do you know whose coat this is? <gasps> I can't even say his name. Joseph's. Guess what Joseph did? Right? Nobody take a picture of that. <laughs> Guess, right. Guess what Joseph did, right? Verse number 17, she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant, which thou hast brought unto us, it's your fault, Potiphar, came in unto me to mock me, and it came to pass. I lifted up my voice and cried. He left his garment with me, and he fled out, and there's the garment right there. came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant unto me, that his wrath was kindled. It's been said, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Potiphar play, Potiphar's wife plays that out for us, right? I'll fast forward a little bit for sake of time, but Joseph, accusations are made. Potiphar makes these accusations. He becomes angry. Joseph winds up in prison. I want you to put yourselves in his shoes for a moment. You've been a faithful servant to your master. You successfully avoided committing adultery with his wife, even though she's practically thrown herself at you. You've been falsely accused. What do you do? Most of us would probably launch a loud and long defense. We have been wrong. We are innocent, right? We would have declared it. We would have vowed to take our revenge when the opportunity presented itself. But not Joseph. And that's why we liken him to Christ. Because Christ, when he was beaten, when he was accused, he opened not his mouth, right? Isaiah 53, 7 prophesied that as fulfilled New Testament scripture. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't defend our name or reputation when it's slandered. But what I am saying, there will be times when you are attacked, when you are misunderstood, when you are misrepresented. And when those times come, remember this. God knows the truth. And the truth will come out. And here's what I'm saying. We must learn to be faithful even during the trials of life. And don't let the hardships and valleys of life throw you off course. I say, well, I have so many critics Nobody likes me. Nothing silences the tongue of a critic more than a faithful life. <laughs> Jonathan, they hate me, and all they do is talk bad about me, and they say this is never going to last. You know what proves that wrong? Faithfulness. Hey, you know what? You can have your opinions about me. That's fine. But I lived how you lived, and it got me nowhere, and I'm sick of playing that game. So I am following Jesus. And he's promised he'll never leave me or forsake me. So hey, listen, wind, blow. But I'm following Jesus. Hey, listen, critic, criticize. That's what they do. But I'm following Jesus. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks of you. It matters how God thinks of you. It matters how God thinks of you. <clears throat> I look at... Uh, Joseph and Joseph endured so much. He's cast out by his family. A lot of us can relate to being ostracized by our family. Right? He then goes. He's sold into slavery. He's promoted because of his faithfulness. He's put into prison. He's promoted again because of his faithfulness. He's brought out of prison. Then he's promoted again because of his faithfulness. Notice the trend here. Trial. Temptation. Difficulty. Faithfulness. 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 You say, but it's hard, Jonathan. Can I tell you that regardless of your position on God, your perception of God, your pursuit of God, regardless of it, there are times, there are seasons where it's hard. Think of a man, we know him now, and we think of his name as a success, Adoniram Judson. Adoniram Judson was a missionary in Burma, for 18 years before he ever took a furlough. That means he never left the field in 18 years. For the first six years of his ministry, he didn't have a single Burmese convert. Imagine being a missionary and writing your prayer letters back to your churches. And they're saying, so how's your ministry going? Who, who have you told about Jesus? Uh, well, nothing this month. And nothing this month. And nothing for, you ready, 72 months. Not a single convert. He said they never saw a ship leave Burma without wanting to go board it and go home. <laughs> I like that because I can relate to it, right? His wife became sick and she had to go home for two years without him. And he wrote, if I could find some quiet resting place on earth where we could spend the rest of our days in peace, 
and perform the ordinary service of religion, or if only we could find. But he then wrote this, life is short, and happiness consists not in outward circumstances. Millions of Burmese are perishing, and I'm almost the only person on earth who has attained their language com to, to communicate salvation. To communicate salvation. We look at a story like that, and we look at the reality, his humanity. But then he came to a point where he said, listen, I've got a job to do, and I'm the one that can do it. He remained faithful, and today we look back and we admire his labors. We speak fervently of his name. Why? Because he was faithful. He's faithful, Joseph's faithful in trials. He's faithful in temptation. He's faithful in tragedy. You look at the life of Joseph, and we'll not, we'll not go through everything, but I think about the time where he's in prison, and he's asked to interpret a dream, and he does so. And He says, the only thing I ask of you is when you get out, would you remember that I'm here? He's forgotten. He's forgotten. So he labors. Can't imagine being forgotten. <laughs> Can't imagine being in such a difficult place that no one even knew I was there. And that's where we find Joseph. Can I tell you that God, when he puts you somewhere, he's faithful to use you where he puts you. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy because sometimes it's very hard. I want to tell you a, a story. There are some missionaries in Zaire. They had a 100-year anniversary of their arrival, and Christians gathered to celebrate from a part of Zaire that was called the Belgian Congo. As they're celebrating, they get toward the end, and the old man stands up, and they're kind of closing out, and he says, I have something to say, and he begins to speak. He says, I'm about to die, and I know something that no other man living knows, and you need to know it. He said, 100 years ago, these missionaries came, and our people didn't know whether to accept these missionaries or not. So we began to poison them. And they began to die. We poisoned missionaries. We poisoned children. And we did this for years. One by one, they became ill and they died. And we buried them. But they didn't leave. He said, we celebrate 100 years of their coming because whenever they died, we watched them. And we saw this. We saw that they believed what they were teaching us. And eventually, they stopped poisoning them. Started listening to them. And 100 years later, their church is in the Belgian Congo. Why? Because people were faithful. Can I say the greatest thing that can ever be said about you and me as far as our walk with the Lord is concerned is this. They were faithful. So, so what's that look like? I'll tell you an illustration. In closing, I was in Bible college and my, my family didn't have money. I was paying my way through Bible college. I was working two jobs. I worked about 60, 60 to 80 hours a week. I was taking 21 credit hours. I normally passed 16 to 18 of those and repeated three of those the next year. <clears throat> I took uh, Greek like two or three times, and it was a great revelation. I took two or three times. It was so, it's such a great class. I just w wanted to take it again. <laughs> and I remember, I remember one day I had, uh, I had worked the night before I'd worked. Uh, they had called me, um, called me in to one of my jobs. I'd worked 2 to 10 to one of my jobs. I get out of class at 1, I eat. I go into the other job at 10, I work 2 to 10. When I got home, I was, the, I was in charge of security at the, uh, the college, and so they called me in, and uh, I worked 10 to 2, and the guy who was supposed to work 2 to 6 was sick, and so I worked uh, 2 to 6. So I worked from 2 to 6 the next morning. And then uh, I went to my room, and I had a, a paper to write because I procrastinated. I know that any of you that know me, that's so hard to believe, uh, but I procrastinated. I had to write this paper. And uh, I went through the classes that day, and uh, everybody else was trying to learn, and I was trying to stay awake. And uh, every day at that college, we would have chapel. And so I went in, 
I sat down, sat toward the back, because honestly, like I was, I was dead, like I was dead. And this was, this was a continual thing. It was coming toward the finals. And he kind of got up and preached. He was an old man, old man. I don't, I don't even remember who he was. I just remember he was old. And he got up and he preached a message. And he's, of course, he's coming to the end of the semester. And so, don't quit is the message. Don't quit. Don't quit. And I remember listening to this message. And I'm thinking, yeah, you say it, but it's, it's tough. And then he went on to explain some things in his life and the different adversities he had gone through. And he closed by giving us this poem, and I just stuck with me. I haven't been able to forget it. And the poem's entitled, you ready? Don't quit. It's a pretty good title. It said, when things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, and you want to smile, but you have to sigh, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns, and every one of us sometimes learns, and many a failure turns about when he might have won had he had stuck it out. Don't give up, though the pace seems slow. You may succeed with another blow. Often the goal is nearer than it seems to faint and faltering man. Often the struggler has given up when he might have captured the victor's cup. And he learned too late when the night slipped down how close he was to the golden crown. And then this line that I, I love, success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems so far. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things seem worst that you must not Elizabeth Elliot had a husband by the name of Jim Elliot. Jim Elliot was a missionary. He was murdered by the Aka Indians. Elizabeth Elliot wrote in her writings later on, God is God, and because he is God, he's worthy of my trust and obedience. I'll find rest nowhere but in his holy will, a will that is unspeakably beyond my largest notions of what he is up to. Some of you are sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, what is God doing? Stop. <laughs> Because you'll not figure it out. But can I tell you what he's doing? He's doing what he always does. He's working his will in a way that brings him glory. And ultimately, it brings us good. And some of you, you're weary. And you came here today, but it was begrudgingly. And you didn't want to be here, to be honest. And you thought to yourself, I, I, just, I, can, I can sit this one out. Can I, just, can I just tell you, hey, listen, you need this fellowship, you need this encouragement, you need this edification, but more than all of that, you just need to be faithful. And when trials come, and when temptation comes, and when tragedy comes, don't waver, don't quit. Faithful, faithful, faithful. Jonathan, tell me what God's doing here. I don't know. <laughs> I wish I knew what he was doing in my life sometimes. But here's what I do know, he's good. He's always good. But if you quit, you're not gonna get to see that. If you bail out, you're not gonna get to experience his goodness. You're gonna miss out on the blessings that he has for you. Would you stand your feet, eyes closed, heads bowed. Father, we love you, we praise you for your goodness to us. Praise you for the life of Joseph. Praise you for the truth that's contained there. Father, I pray that we'd be faithful in the midst of trial, tragedy, temptation. Father, that we'd experience your goodness, your grace, and the reality of it. I pray that you would be with the one who's straying right now, and they're coming up close to that precipice, and they're thinking to themselves, hey, this is as good a try as any. Hey, can I, can I implore you, God, to work in their heart, and God, to speak to them, and that your spirit would move in them, and that they'd understand that. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And God, the greatest testimony of our lives could be that we were faithful. We thank you for your son who was faithful to the cross. We thank you, God, for being faithful to us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Your head's bowed, your eyes closed, no one looking around. Simply two questions. If you say, Jonathan, 
You're speaking today, and I am just going through the ringer. I'm dealing with some stuff, and I am hurting. Say, Jonathan, that's me this morning, and I just, I am reminded of my weakness, and I'm reminded of his strength. You say, Jonathan, that's me. Would you pray for me this morning? Would you slip your hand up there where you are, all around the room? See those hands, many hands. Put your hands down. Thank you for that. If you say, Jonathan, you're preaching, you're talking about God's your strength. You're talking about being faithful to God. And to be honest, I don't have a relationship with God. If I died today, I don't know where I'd spend eternity. I, I don't know where to start. You say, Jonathan, that concerns me. My eternity concerns me. If I died, I don't know where I'd spend eternity. I don't know where I stand with God. Would you slip your hand up there where you are? I'd like to pray for you. No one looking around. Can I encourage you? I'm going to be quiet, and I just encourage you to do some business with the Lord. You're straying, you're struggling. Can I encourage you, as the song's saying here, hey, just come to Jesus. You're battling, you're weary, you're broken. Come to Jesus. You don't know up from down. Come to Jesus. The altar's open. If you need to pray with someone, come to the front. I'll have someone pray with you. You can pray there in your seat, but however the Lord leads you, would you do business with Him?